Hi everyone, it's Wayne Jones, the course coordinator for Australian Employment Law. This, um, these are my comments about um, part two of uh, chapter nine in the textbook, which dealt with compliance and enforcement. Um, previously, we were talking about the uh, first part of the chapter up to and including 9.9, .9, uh, which dealt um, predominantly with the dispute resolution aspect of um, of the Fair Work Act. Now we're talking about compliance and enforcement. The reading for this part is Chapter 9 from Paragraph 9.10 on enforcement. <coughs> All right, we'll note the comments first and foremost about record keeping and um, of course it, it, uh, it probably sounds like it's stating the obvious but um, very hard to, to uh, enforce your rights um, if uh, there aren't any clear records around when it is the person's worked, uh, what hours they've worked uh, and the conditions under which they've worked. So if you have a look at Division 3, Part 3.6, particularly Section 3, uh, 535 of the Fair Work Act, the employer has obligations in relation to employee records and pay slips. Um, some of the major points are these, that the records need to be kept uh, accurately for a period of seven years in a prescribed form. Um, a payslip is meant to be made available within a day from when the person is paid and um, uh, copies are meant to be available um, on request either from the employee or from a person uh, or for a or to a person who's uh, acting on their behalf and requests a copy. Um, here's a copy of the Fair Work Regulations, Regulation 3.46. There is in fact more to this regulation, but here's the first part of it that tells us um, what a payslip must specify. So make sure you have a look at regulation 3.46. The Fair Work Act and the Fair Work Ombudsman's Office appoint um, inspectors. The purpose of the inspectors is to go out and make sure that the, uh, uh, the provisions of the Act uh, of um, awards and industrial instruments are being uh, properly followed by um, employers. And uh, in the past, we've had a look at the Fair Work Ombudsman's site, and I would urge you to um, continue to visit that site for more information. Uh, look at section 708 in the uh, Act, particularly 708 to 712 in the Fair Work Act, outlines the compliance powers that uh, an inspector has when they reasonably believe that a person's contravening either the national employment standards, an award, or an enterprise agreement, etc. Um, some of the powers, apart from the power to enter the premises under section 708, are these, to inspect any work or process or object, interview people, uh, require them to produce records, uh, inspect and make copies of uh, records, and that would usually be, of course, wage records and employment records and take samples. Um, the outcome of an inspection is that, uh, well, it could be threefold. The inspector may issue a compliance notice directing a person to take specified action. So it, it, that's probably at the first level. So just telling the person they need to start to keep better records, something like that. They might issue an infringement notice requiring a person to pay a penalty. Um, now, it's only a fraction, a fraction of the maximum penalty, and it's only in relation to employment records or pay slips. Have a look at section 558 in that respect. Um, they might require a person to um, sign an enforceable undertaking. Look at section 715. Now, lawyers are usually familiar with the word undertaking. It's a bit more than a promise. Um, it's a promise that usually a person is aware will have some serious consequences if it's broken, and that's the situation here. A breach of an undertaking uh, is treated seriously as a, uh, as a further breach um, of, um, of an order. Now, apart from inspectors, the union officials who represent the workers at the particular business enterprise also have... Um, a role to play in enforcing industrial um, instruments. Uh, the case um, that I've mentioned there, the Australian Industry Group, uh, 
is authority for the proposition that um, uh, no powers of entry are permitted to be contained in either awards, and look at section 152, or in workplace agreements. And we've mentioned that previously, that prohibited con uh, content in both awards and workplace agreements includes um, in, uh, rights of entry. They're meant to be dealt with uh, through this statutory regime, and they're not meant to be dealt with as um, part of the workplace um, agreements or as awards. Now, the exception to that is they are allowed to get a mention if, they, if we're talking about the specific purpose of uh, representing employees as part of a dis dispute resolution process. For ex so, for example, if an employee is in dispute with, uh, with their employer in the workplace over an issue, it might be, say, a workload issue, something like that, they are entitled to be represented and that can get a mention in an award or in a, yeah, an enterprise agreement. Um, a little bit to be said about rights of entry because it's a tricky area. Um, and you can see, if you have a look at the uh, early part of the, uh, the Act which deals with this, it's, a, it's said to be a balancing act between the right of the employer and the occupiers to continue um, going about their business unhindered and then on the other hand, the, uh, uh, the, the right to um, a, a union, the right of the union official to come and make sure that the, um, uh, the legislation and various industrial instruments are being uh, properly complied with. So what the Fair Work Act sets up is a statutory regime that uh, regulates this right of an entry, right of entry for a union official to come, uh, onto, come to a business. First and foremost, the un not all union officials can do it. So Section 15, uh, 512 to 513 talks about the official being a person who's a holder of a current permit. Um, in other words, the union official has to apply to Fair Work Commission to be the holder of a permit and must demonstrate they're a fit and proper person. When they receive their permit, it can be subject to terms and conditions and um, I guess just as importantly, um, it's valid for a period of three years but can be revoked if the person turns out to be, through their actions, not a fit and proper person. And I think your textbook gives you some examples of occasions where a um, union officials have not been given a permit because they're not fit and proper or they've had it varied. Um, Section 481 in the Act speaks to the purpose uh, of um, for which uh, a person can enter uh, a business. Um, and uh, Section 481 talks about uh, the entry being for the purpose of investigating a suspected breach of the Act or of a relevant workplace instrument. The breach has to affect one of their members and they may need to show later how it is they say they had reasonable grounds for that uh, suspicion. The Act requires that uh, the employer be given a notice. So Section 487 of the Fair Work Act says that unless there's an exemption given under five, Section 519, and I'll come back to that in a second, a valid notice must be given not more than 14 days and not less than 24 hours before. So there's a bit of a window there. You could, you could set up your notice in advance. You could issue, issue a series of notices if you intended to visit a series of workplaces, uh, but not more than 14 days time and not less than 24 hours notice. Now coming back to section 519, if you have a look at that section, you'll see um, that it is possible for the, uh, the union official who's the, um, uh, the, uh, the holder of the, the permit, it is possible for them to go to Fair Work Commission and ask for an exemption certificate um, and just reading now from 519, section 519.1b, the circumstances are where Fair Work Commission reasonably, reasonably believes that advance notice of the entry given by an entry notice might result in the destruction, concealment or alteration of relevant evidence. So no examples, but um, you can imagine if um, you were dealing with particularly um, scrupulous employer, you might not want to give that uh, that notice.
particularly um, if it related to, to something um, uh, associated with safety, for example. A valid entry notice complies with Section 518 of the Fair Work Act when it specifies what premises um, the union official proposes to enter, the date of entry, uh, the organisation the permit holder represents, so it might be the AMIEU, it might be the CFMEU, whatever the organisation is, particulars of suspected contravention, or if they're going to have discussions, particulars of the proposed discussions. The Act also demands production of timesheets um, and records to the, uh, to the permit holder. So the permit holder will ask for timesheets, pay records, etc. And if you look at sections 481 to 483, you'll see you're entitled to do that, view work, conduct interviews, etc. So it sounds a little bit like the powers that were given to the uh, Fair Work uh, Ombudsman um, inspectors. Um, while they're on the premises, these are the things that the officials need to do. They've got to produce the permit um, on request. Uh, they have to uh, only attend during working hours, and if it's for the purpose of uh, a meeting and for discussions, uh, only during a break. Now, that can be during the lunch hour or any other break. Uh, while they're there, observe the local workplace health and safety rules, uh, meet where we're directed, uh, and take the route to the meeting place uh, as directed by the uh, employer and not enter into any part of the uh, premises that might in fact be residential premises. Um, it can be a breach of, the, of that right of entry once the official's taken all of those steps. If the employer uh, either refuses entry or hinders, in some way hinders the, um, uh, the permit holder from going out the business um, that was stated in the permit. Okay, well now just more generally on interpretation of instruments. Um, it sounds a little bit like the statutory interpretation rules that we looked at uh, together, if you've done that with me, but if not, the sorts of things that the courts uh, have suggested with respect to interpreting industrial instruments or workplace, workplace instruments are these. You should have regard to the context, including industrial realities, and there are some case examples given. Try to work towards the ordinary meaning, and there's a reason for that. Um, you want to avoid the strictly literal or pedantic approach, but coming back to the ordinary meaning again, you're always striving to find the objective meaning of the words that are in front of you, rather than the subjective. Now, um, in statutory interpretation, that's because the courts don't take any note of what they thought the particular people at the time uh, meant, simply because the Act is always speaking. And same with, uh, with industrial instruments. Remember that there aren't any parties to the instrument, so it's, it's going to be not terribly relevant what they thought on a subjective basis. The, the instrument should stand on its own two feet and speak objectively. All right, now just thinking about court enforcement. Um, have a look at the Act and have a look at the table that's contained in Part 4.1 4 of the Act at Section 539. Now, it's quite extensive. It'll take you a minute to flick through. You don't need to read the whole lot of it. But uh, just get a fair sort of indication of, um, uh, of, of how that table works. Um, I've just fl flicked it open to Part 3.4, Rights of Entry. So... Um, the, how the table works, working from left to right, is an item number. Um, I'm looking now, standing, jurisdiction, etc. So the, the, the standing is uh, uh, for right of entry. Uh, anyone who's affected by the contravention or an inspector. Uh, the court, uh, you take the, uh, breaches of that section to the federal court or the federal circuit court. Maximum penalty, uh, 60 penalty units. And uh, there's a whole list of sections that relate to right of entry, for example, that um, uh, are subject to that penalty. So have a look at that. And, and there are plenty of opportunities, of course. Any any of the civil penalty um, provisions, well, all of the civil uh, remedy provisions should be mentioned in that table. So who can seek the remedy? What's the appropriate court uh, to institute proceedings? And what's the maximum penalty? 
Now, very important, this one, as with all statutory regimes, is always going to be a sunset, uh, uh, a statute of limit limitations, if you like. And in this Act, it's generally 60, six years. So Section 544 of the Act says that proceedings must be commenced within six years. So that's six years from when the cause of action accrued. In addition to a penalty, a court can order any, make any other order it considers appropriate. And uh, I suppose think they order uh, think about things like um, uh, an order requiring a person to do something, to deliver up documents, or to start complying with uh, uh, an instrument. Section 551, uh, again quite important, tells us that the rules of evidence and the procedures for civil matters apply to this Act. Now that's opposed, of course, to criminal matters, which have a higher um, onus of proof. Um, in, so therefore, for, for the Fair Work Act, the rules of evidence, the procedures for civil matters apply, and that means, uh, so far as standard of proof is concerned, uh, matters need to be proved on the balance of probabilities. Let's talk about penalties for a second. Um, first of all, have a look at uh, these sections, section 546, the court may apply a pecuniary penalty. There's going to be different penalties for individuals and for corporations. And if you look at 546.2, you'll see the penalties are five times greater for a corporation than they are for an individual. Um, two or more breaches out of the same course of conduct can be counted as a single breach. Look at section 557 because it is quite specific about um, what sort of breaches we're talking about there. See, just before I leave that, that can be quite important. Otherwise, you could have um, the cumulative effect of the penalties uh, could be uh, perhaps more than was, was intended by the Act if, if there were a whole series of uh, reasonably serious penalties applied. Um, what do you have to think about? Well, these are, you know, turn this on its head, what sort of submissions should you make if you are um, acting for either of the parties? Uh, the, the, the courts have said, you look at what's just and appropriate in all the circumstances, thinking about these things. The extent of any loss or damage caused to the parties, whether the breach is deliberate, any expression of contrition or corrective action. For example, the employee might have been uh, paid the wages which were um, underpaid by the time the matter comes to court. Uh, plus the need for specific and general deterrence. As so far as recovery of underpayments are concerned, if you look at Section 545.1 of the Fair Work Act, you go to the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit Court uh, to make, uh, and those courts uh, can make any order that they consider appropriate um, uh, to recover underpayments. Um, but when we're talking specifically about a financial amount, look at 545.3, because it says you can go to an eligible state court to um, uh, to, to order an employer to pay an amount that's unpaid under the Act or under a Fair Work instrument. Um, note the comments on accessories, I think very important. 550 says anybody who's involved in the contravention, and that includes a long list of uh, definitions, aiding, abetting, procuring, inducing, etc., or in any way knowingly concerned, can be penalised as if they're the principal offender. So that means directors, so directors may be uh, drawn into the proceedings and they may also be ordered to pay compensation. Um, in the case of claiming money under a common law contract, that's uh, an action for debt or money due. And you'd normally bring that in the state court. Um, you can sue for damages as a foreseeable result of the breach. Um, if you can establish that in some way this, uh, there is an entitlement to damage. Specific performance, not very likely um, to be ordered, except in the cases where we're talking about confidential information or a person is engaging in competitive activity that they'd agreed not to be involved in. Again, back to jurisdiction, common law actions, state courts, um, employment contract, money claims generally end up in the state courts at the appropriate level. So if you're just chasing uh, a dollar amount, um, generally we're talking about going to the state courts. 
the um, textbook refers to the Queensland provision, in fact, that um, which does give uh, jurisdiction um, to the state courts. And I think we're talking about the Industrial Relations Act um, in Queensland, uh, section 278. Um, the reason that that section still stands and is able to stand is if I took you back to week one or week two where we talked about section 27, um, allowable matters for state laws includes claims for enforcement of contracts of employment. So the state can still make laws about claims for enforcement of contracts of employment and that's what they've done. So that 1999 um, Industrial Relations Act section still applies. Um, have a look at sections 541 to 543. Also, safety net contract entitlements um, can be, uh, and other entitlements can be enforced in the federal courts as if uh, they were statutory entitlements. And the example that's given is really anything that's covered by the National Employment Standards or by a modern award um, can be um, the, the can be the subject of a claim. Um, just finally then, make sure you have a look at the situation where the employer goes broke, because that'll happen quite a bit. If you're looking at insolvency or employee entitlements, try to get them out of uh, an employer. Note the comments in the text about where the employees sit in the scheme of things, not only under the Corporations Act, but also under the Bankruptcy Act, and you'll see that unfortunately, um, Secured creditors like banks, etc., are always going to be ahead, with with few exceptions. So to answer that, um, there was a non-statutory scheme called Gears, but that's now been replaced by the Fair Entitlements Guarantee Act. I've given you a link on the Moodle page to the Fair, not only the Fair Entitlements Guarantee Act, but also the link to the page with the Department of Employment. Um, have a look at that link. What happens essentially is um, when the employer goes broke um, and the employee uh, takes all reasonable steps to try and recover um, the entitlements and is unsuccessful, um, they can make an application for a payment out of this fund. Now, a person who had some sort of personal connection back to the company that's gone broke cannot make that claim. So, and, and that's probably for obvious reasons. So if you are um, uh, related to the director of the company, you, chances are you're not going to be able to make um, such a claim. But please have a look at the link because that does come up quite often, as you can imagine, where companies do go into insolvency. There's a perfectly legitimate claim for payments. Remember, remember we're talking about things like not only unpaid wages, but also long service leave, annual leave, um, and uh, notice and redundancy pay. That, that can all add up to quite a, a sum of money. All right, they're my comments for this week. Um, next week we're going to talk about uh, remuneration, uh, and that's the material which is covered in uh, Chapter 10 of the textbook. We'll talk again soon.